Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Stephanie Everett, and this is episode 255 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Dan Pink about why you should charge less after lunch or just not charge by the hour in the first place. If today's podcast resonates with you and you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, get the first chapter right now for free at lawyers.com slash book. Today's podcast is brought to you by PwC Insights Officer, Ross Intelligence, SaneBox, and Alert Communications. We wouldn't be able to do our show without their support, so please stay tuned and we'll tell you more about them later on. Hey, Sam. So, you know, we've started talking about mental health more on the podcast, and I have been pleasantly surprised with how many people from the community have started reaching out and sharing their mental health stories with us. Yeah, it's been gratifying to hear. I mean, I've gotten a few messages of thanks for your podcast this morning. I'm going to get help, which is amazing. It is so amazing. But I was, you know, we made this call to people and we said, hey, share your stories with us because we'd love to talk about it more. And now we're, I'm kind of wondering, what are we going to do next with these stories? <laughs> yeah, uh, people have been sharing and we asked, but we didn't have a clear idea of how we would want to share those. And so I guess maybe we put that to the listeners. How would you like to get them? I don't want to, this podcast is after all about, you know, starting, managing, building successful law practices. And to the extent that mental health is a really important piece of that, we're going to keep talking about it. But I don't want that to overwhelm the podcast either. And I'm not sure that, you know, uh, just hearing story after story is going to resonate with, you know, a ton of people. Although I think hearing stories is important because sometimes one of those stories is the thing that triggers it for you, like it was for me, like it was for apparently lots of other people. So I think that's really important, but we haven't really decided how to share those. So I'd love to hear listeners' ideas about how would you like to hear those stories, what might work for you. And so I guess the best way to do that is maybe to email one of us, Stephanie at lawyerist.com or Sam at lawyerist.com. Yeah. If you've got a story to share or an idea for how we ought to share them, go ahead and let us know. I mean, maybe what we should do is just relate them, you know, ask for people to email their stories and we can relate them and that way we can protect anonymity if people want it or maybe people think they would want to read them or that we should do short segments on the podcast at the end or at the beginning i don't know give us your ideas we'd love to hear it so now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with tc whitaker from pwc insights officer and then my conversation with dan pink hey everyone this is tc whitaker ceo of insights officer looking forward to speaking with everyone Welcome back, TC. So we've talked about efficiency and we've talked about how data can be what's getting in your way on things like bookkeeping and billing. Today, we're going to talk about metrics and specifically flat fees. So let's say I'm going to move to flat fees. How do I do that? Do I still track hours in detail? What? How do I know if I'm doing flat fees right? So great question. And I think a lot of attorneys hate me when I say this to them. But if you are moving to a flat fee model, I am a spoiler and I hate to do this, Tracking your hours becomes even more critical and more important than it was when you were in the billable hour world. Do I need to be as granular like, you know, 0.2 hours for drafting an email or can I track hours in bigger blocks? So I think and I think it is critically important to continue to be as granular because there can be certain parts of the work that is done on a case where now you can start to think about leverage. So instead of just recording a big block against uh, client matter and what you've been working on, you can actually look at who inside your firm is working on what piece of work for that type of matter. And why this is so important is because of this concept of leverage. In the billable hour world, you want your highest paid billers to be billing the most hours. In the flat fee world, this changes. It is the exact opposite. The people who bill at the highest rates, you want them to be working the least amount of time on these matters. We need to look at what pieces of work can we push down to different staff levels to have those staff prepare the work, do the bulk of the work, and then push it up to the higher, more experienced attorneys for them to review for them to look at. The same thing works with our paralegals. We have our paralegals do more. They then can push that up to us. And then at that level, we can do the review. Now, all of a sudden, what I've just described to everyone is leverage. This is exactly what this is. And in the flat fee world, 
leverage is what drives profitability into your firm. You know, I've never really thought about it in in that exact way before, but obviously that's what's going on. The flat fee that you charge is your budget for the project and your highest billers are your most expensive investment in that project. And so you only want them doing work if it's work that only they can do, right? You don't want to use expensive services unless you have to. That's exactly right. And this is a mindset shift, right? If you've come Mm -hmm. out of this billable world You've just thought, okay, I need to do all of this for my client. My client is hiring me to do all of this work. And so what I think a lot of the market has started to see is that your client, and I say this as kindly as I can say it, isn't necessarily hiring you, Mr. and Mrs. Mm -hmm. Attorney, to do all this work. Your client is hiring you for an outcome. Your client is hiring you for a, a piece of value that you're creating for them to create that will or testament to represent them or to have this other piece of documentation completed and done for them. Not necessarily that you, the highest billing person in the firm, worked on it the most hours. That's really not what the client's after. They're after results and value that create. And if you can do that in a fixed fee arrangement, what the market's telling a lot of the attorneys that I speak with across the country is I want that type of arrangement rather than just opening up my checkbook and saying, okay, however many hours it takes, I guess I'll write you a check at the end of it. Mm-hmm. People just don't want to do business like that anymore. So do you have any tips for estimating flat fees or for starting out and figuring out what your flat fees ought to be? I know that's after the initial resistance, that's often the next question is like, how do I even get started? How do I know what to charge? I think that's a great question. And what we need to do is we need to go back and look at some of that existing data that's inside of our firm. And what I tell a lot of people is this doesn't have to be an all on or all off switch. It doesn't have to be like that. There are certain things that you can do, certain types of matters that you can take inside your firm and say, I'm going to flat fee just these types of matters. And maybe those are ones where you have good data on. You've done 100 of them. You've done 200 of them, 300 of them. And you can go back and look how much time on average have I spent on these cases and do they look pretty similar to each other? And then based on that, now I can start to estimate and think about what is the normal amount of time. What you have to be very careful of though, and this is a hard thing for people to do, what you have to be very careful of is don't let the outliers influence Mm -hmm. you. Our human brains are really bad about this. Our brains are horrible about this. So get the data, put the data together, look at what the average is and don't let your brain trick you and influence you by only looking at those outliers. We did a whole podcast about this on uh, the important thing is, did you make good decisions, not did you have good outcomes? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So to learn more about how Insights Officer can help you make good decisions in your firm with good data, with automated bookkeeping, billing, and insights for your firm, visit insightsofficer.com. TC, once again, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Daniel Pink. I'm the author of six books, including the most recent one, When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing, uh, and among other books, a book called Drive, Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. Welcome to the podcast, Dan. Of the other four books, are there books that you're particularly proud of that have not made it as far into the public consciousness that you'd like to highlight? Well, I mean, I think they all could have gotten even further into the public consciousness. (laughs) Uh, I'm still working on that. And, you know, I'm I'm equally proud and ashamed of all six of them. (laughs) That sounds about right. Do you reread your work or do you find it painful to reread your work? I find it excruciating to reread my work, but I do because I learned some things. Although sometimes don't you pick something up and you're like, wow, that sounds really smart. I can't believe I wrote that. Uh, I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> awesome. So you hit my consciousness when you were talking about Drive and when you wrote Drive, in part because I was managing a small firm at the time. I was getting lawyer stuff off the ground and thinking about compensation. I must have tried 17 yeah. different compensation models on my poor junior associate at the time. When we heard you talk at the Clio Cloud Conference, somebody asked you a question about, you know, if you went back to drive and was there anything you'd like to correct from that or update from that? And it sounds like maybe there is. So maybe you could remind us of the takeaways from drive yeah, and yeah. tell us your new understanding of, of any of them. So the big idea from drive, which looked at 50 years of behavioral science, is that a lot of the motivators that we rely on are less effective than we think. Uh, in particular, a certain kind of motivator that psychologists call a controlling contingent motivator and I call an if-then reward, as in if you do this, then you get that. 50 years of research tells us that those kinds of rewards are not all rewards, which is important, but those particular kinds of rewards 
are good for simple tasks with short time horizons. They work pretty well uh, because human beings love rewards. So you dangle a carrot in front of somebody or a bonus in front of somebody and you have their attention. You have their attention in a very fixed, narrow way that can improve performance when the task is relatively straightforward. It's routine, it's algorithmic. It's like, if you do this, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Or would that include things like profit shares or... Well, no, I think like profit shares are a little bit different, but let's, okay. let's, let's get to that. Uh, it's a really, really important distinction. And one of the things about the research and drive is that it is, there's nuance to it. And mm-hmm. so let's explore that in a second. So let's take this, I, this, take this if then reward. If you do this, then you get that. The research shows that while they're effective for these kinds of narrow algorithmic kinds of tasks where you can see the finish line, they're actually far less effective than we realize for more complicated tasks with longer time horizons, tasks that require judgment, creative thinking, uh, those those sorts of things. And the reason is the same, that if-then rewards, contingent rewards, get us to focus narrowly. And that's good for some tasks, not good for other tasks. And when we think about the nature of work, and including the nature of legal work, some amount of legal work has been relatively simple and routine. But that kind of work now is getting automated. And so the work that remains in white collar professions in general, and in the legal profession in particular, is much more about divergent thinking, discernment, a heuristic kind of thinking. And so the fun stuff, what we I, I think it is more fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I really do. And what we know about that is that for that, you need a different motivational regime. Hmm. And that motivational regime is about paying people well, okay? So let's talk to some of the nuance. The research shows that intrinsic motivators are the pathway to high performance. But that doesn't mean that people don't care about money. People do care about money. They care. Of course, they want to feel well paid, especially if they're doing hard work or work that- Exactly. They yeah. want to be, the human beings are exquisitely attuned to the norm of fairness. Mm-hmm. We want to be paid fairly. We want to be treated fairly. And so- you got to pay people enough. you got to pay people well. People measure fairness in compensation based on, on internal equity and external equity. Equity meaning fairness, not ownership. So, you know, let's say you have a squadron of lawyers and who are, who are similarly situated. They are doing comparable kinds of work, comparable levels of contribution, and some are being paid more than others. That's unfair. Um, yeah. And so the people who are underpaid become demotivated. If you have a small firm in, I don't know, say Kansas City, and your associates are getting paid significantly less than every other small firm in Kansas City, your associates are going to be demotivated. You can give them all the autonomy, mastery, and purpose in the world, and it's not going to matter because they're going to feel like shit. Precisely, because that money is a threshold motivator. Yeah. you got to get through it, okay? And the mistake that some people have made in looking at this, not so much my book, but the entire body of research, is that money does intrinsic motivators matter, therefore money doesn't. Right. <laughs> that is not correct. Yeah, no, no, no. Hold they on. Both, they both matter. So you got to pay. So money is a motivator. You got to pay people fairly. You got to pay people well. Once you do that, again, for these more higher level tasks, what people need are exactly as you say autonomy, which is some control over what they do, who they do it with, how they do it, mastery, which is the ability to make progress and meaningful work, to get better at something that matters, and also purpose, which is. You know, do you know why you're doing something or is what you're doing making a difference is what you're doing making a contribution? Now, let me get at this issue of profit sharing because it's a really good one. All right. What the research doesn't say, the research doesn't say that variable comp is inherently evil. Hmm. It doesn't say that. What it says is that you have to be very careful with it. All right. And so one of the things with especially high stakes, if then rewards, is that it encourages it can encourage the wrong behavior. It can encourage behavior that is perhaps deleterious to clients and customers. It can encourage behavior that is cheating, um, that right, where, you're trying right. game, where you're trying to game the system in order to get the reward. What I like about profit sharing as a v- form of variable comp is that there are a couple of things, or two things in particular. One, it's fair. If I've got a firm of five people and together we have increased profits and everybody has pulled their own weight. It is fair to give everybody a piece of the action. It's actually unfair not to do that. At the same time, it's very difficult for one person to game, right? I can lie about my billable hours, right? I can pad my billable hours. But when it comes to the profits for an entire firm, it's very hard for me to to cheat my way there. It's just, you know, and and so healthy base salaries with some amount of profit sharing, I actually don't, I, I think that the research tells us are not 
a problem. But you're thinking of them as just a component of fair compensation. The incentives are autonomy, mastery, and purpose. The profit share is in the nature of fair compensation. Did I get that right? Yeah, it's fair. I'm not sure that lawyers doing challenging work are going to work harder if they have some amount of profit sharing than if they don't. Mm-hmm, right. um, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you could run that experiment inside of a firm. <laughs> Good. You could take 10 yeah. associates and, you could in, in, and play five of them one way and five of them the other way. I actually think that what you're better off doing is I think that if the only reason that people in your firm will work hard is that they get profit sharing, um, I don't think that's an incentive problem. I think it's a hiring problem. Yeah. I think you've hired the wrong people. Um, and so again, you know, I don't think the research gives us perfectly clear black and white, very doctrineer guidance. What it tells us is that the design principles are pay people well, pay people fairly, offer autonomy, mastery, and purpose. If you want to offer variable comp, that's not inherently evil, but you got to be really, really conscious of some of the downsides of it. But if you have some variable comp that is simple difficult to game and for reflecting measures that matter, I don't think it's that bad. The, the one side, and let's talk about, I mean, I, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. The one aspect of certain kinds of variable comp and incentive plans that we don't talk about enough is that they exact an administrative cost, right? right? If you construct a complicated incentive system, you have to monitor that. Mm -hmm. You have to administer that. You have to adjudicate grievances about that. And that exacts a cost on any firm. And so this is why the principles of making it simple, transparent, hard to game uh, are enormously important if you're going to carve out some amount, if you're going to do something like profit sharing or any other kind of variable comp. That makes a ton of sense. And the output of this, if you if you have fair compensation, if you've motivated people with autonomy, mastery, and purpose, the outcome of that is that you have people who are motivated to do well, and they're motivated in a way that is likely to result in them being able to do their best work, which matters a lot for knowledge work jobs like law or programming yeah. or design. What kinds of jobs in a firm or a normal small business might that not matter so much for? I think those kinds of jobs are falling by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, so, so for instance, at one point, a hundred years ago, I worked as an associate at a uh, summer associate at a law firm. And uh, I remember this law firm in New York and they had um, this, I'm, I'm showing my age here, is that they had this room full of word processors when I say word processes, I mean people yep. <laughs> who were working at, because it, it, at the time, like not every lawyer had a computer on her desk. And mm-hmm. so, so these are people who like, you could, you could like draft something, you know, by hand. I mean, you know, I, I didn't, I personally didn't do this because I was obviously young, but some of the older lawyers there at the time would like draft things by hand and then hand these sheets of paper to individuals who would then type them up onto these newfangled computer things. And so, so for that kind of work, I mean, I think there it's like if you pay people for accuracy and speed, you're probably going to get better work done because it doesn't require a huge amount of judgment or right. uh, judgment or discernment. And so, but but again, if you look at the, the mistake that a lot of the labor forecasters made at that time was that you know we would be our own word processors, our own data entry clerks. That those weren't going to be jobs. That those were going to be things that we did as, that all white collar workers did as part of their own jobs. Right. Uh, and so a lot, I think a lot of the things that are very rote and we are becoming automated. I don't know, what would you say is something within a law firm that is more rote and routine? Maybe something like, I don't know. Maybe like the bookkeeper, or the, but I, yeah. don't, I don't even know. Like, you know, because I, I like to explore in the kinds of books that you write, there's often, you know, it feels like a, a way of looking at, at the world, but it's really a way of looking at a piece of the world. And so I like exploring those edges. Like the founders of Basecamp, we had, um, yeah. we had Jason Fried on to talk about, you know, their workflow. And I was like, come on, does your accounting department use this? And he was like, no, it doesn't actually apply to them. So I, I always just like to explore with authors, where doesn't this apply? And so that's that was my motivation yeah, for asking. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think that, I mean, it's an interesting question. So I think that if you think about bookkeepers and accountants within a law firm, first of all, you know, a lot of accounting and bookkeeping has become automated. So what the people right. who are accountants and bookkeepers are doing actually requires some more judgment these days. That's they're not too. simply adding up, they're, at, they're not simply, they're not putting on green eye shades and and putting their, you know, running their ruler under a, a column of figures and adding <laughs> it's not just data entry anymore. Right. I, you know, and so and so a lot of what they're doing is actually higher level work. I think that the task there is to hire good people, pay them fairly, and then 
you can you can apply some measure of you you can apply autonomy master and purpose to jobs that are a little bit more routine. Yeah, it's not going to harm them. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, like like autonomy is, is a mixed bag. Like for instance, like sure. you don't want to say, oh, you're an accountant, you have the autonomy to deviate from generally accepted accounting practices. No, you don't have that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, oh, you're a bookkeeper, you have the autonomy to do our books in base twelve rather than base ten. No, that's not allowed. But what you can do, especially in that kind of work, is you can go into, I think one of the most useful things that comes out in the research is explain to people why they're doing what they're doing. So the reason we need you to be, so first of all, bookkeeper, we're going to pay you well. Uh, we're going to give you a sense of mission and part of the team. Your ability to keep the books is actually a big part of our ability to serve our clients well. That part of our capacity for service our clients well is getting a good sense of what we're doing and, and whether we're billing fairly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can give people uh, some amount of sovereignty over crafting their what's called job crafting, which is built on the work of Jane Dutton and Amy Rusnowski. Some very powerful work showing that in jobs that's, that superficially seem low autonomy, if you give people some ability to craft the job in a way that's meaningful to them, uh, that can be very powerful in motivating people and reducing attrition and restoring a sense of meaning and purpose. For sure. So we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back... We're going to talk about why you should charge less after lunch. So we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> With Ross Intelligence, lawyers conducting legal research leverage AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Ask a query in natural language on the Ross legal research platform, and Ross will return on point case law. Attorney Jonathan Udoka says he's able to use Ross as though it were a first year associate doing top flight legal research. At $89 a month, Ross is not only fast and intuitive, it's also affordable. See what Ross can do. Go to rossintelligence.com slash lawyerist today and get a 14 day free trial. Use the promo code lawyerist for 10% off your first year subscription. Longtime podcast listeners and lawyerist readers know that Sam and I get pretty excited about email productivity tips, but we know that most people don't have the time or energy to be email productivity nerds like us. So it's great that SameBox will take care of fixing your inbox for you. I've used SameBox for a while now, and it automatically organizes your incoming email into smart folders so you don't have to be overwhelmed by a busy inbox and don't have to see important client emails next to junky coupon offers, distracting you from the work you need to do. Best yet, SameBox learns with you, so if you find it puts something in the wrong folder, just move it, and SameBox will automatically learn your preference. It also has nifty features like Sane Black Hole, where you can drag messages from annoying senders you never want to hear from again. It's so simple, you won't need to learn anything to use it. It just takes care of everything itself. SaneBox works directly with every single email server or service that has ever been created, so it will definitely work for you. Get a free two-week trial and a $25 credit by visiting samebox.com slash lawyerist today. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash lawyerist. A legal-only call center, Alert Communications has been helping law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake for over 50 years. Alert responds to and captures all leads for your law firm efficiently using their highly trained intake specialists and software solutions. They work 24-7, 365 as an extension of your law firm in both English and Spanish. Alert strives to set best practice standards within the mass tort legal community by using ethical ideals, in turn elevating the quality of client services and earning the trust of attorneys. To find out how Alert can increase your mass tort or class action lead conversion rates, call 844-MY-INTAKE or find them at alertcommunications.com. Okay, we're back. So Dan, uh, that got a burst of laughter out of you. And it makes me chuckle too. It was a provocative thing that you said during the Clio Cloud Conference. And before we get to that, I think you need to introduce us to the concept of timing and explain to us why you think it's so important. And we should stop chuckling about presentations after lunch and how snoozy we are and start actually planning around that. So, well, here's what we know. So we tend to make our decisions about timing, the gamut of timing from what we do at different times of day to how we sequence things to how conscious we are of beginnings and middles and ends. We tend to make those decisions in a very sloppy, intuitive way. We make them based on default settings. We make them based on you know, intuition and instinct. Most of us have some idea of when is the best time to, when we're most productive, right? Like I've always had this idea, I'm most productive in the morning, but I've never actually like done much to sculpt my day around that. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So that's an intuition and, and intuition sometimes guide us in the right direction, but many times they don't. Uh, and what I'm saying in this book is that we don't need to use intuition because we have this incredible body of science across multiple disciplines that give us actual evidence to help inform our when decisions. Mm -hmm. 
And what we know at, say, the, the unit of a day is, are some really important things is that there's a mountain of research that shows that our cognitive abilities do not remain static over the course of the day. Our brain power changes over the course of a day. Our brain power changes in significant, can, can change in significant ways so that the difference between our daily high point and our daily low point can be massive. And uh, the way to sculpt your day, as you say, is depends in part on what, what your chronotype is. That is, are you, you know, are you natively an early morning person, a late night person, or somewhere in between? and the kind of job that you're doing. So as a shortcut, I'll just say there is an abundance of science to back this up, that you you are cognitively different at different times of the day, period. And if people want to see that, you've got some great talks on YouTube that people can watch or, you know, pick up the book because you should. Sure. Do you have a favorite example, though, that, to kind of illustrate this? Like the earnings reports was the one that kind of stood out in my memory. But um, Oh, interesting. But do you have a favorite example of timing and how it matters? To me, one of the most compelling is the study of uh, Danish standardized tests. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Denmark, students take standardized tests. Uh, they take them on computers rather than on pencil and paper bubble forms. But the typical Danish school has more students than computers. So on testing day, every student can take the test at the same time. So the students are randomly assigned to take the test at different times of day. Uh, so that leads us to what's called a natural experiment, that we have what, what looks like a randomized controlled trial, but it actually happened in real life. And in this case, in Denmark, it happened at a massive scale, 2 million hmm. Danish test takers. So this is some work done by Francesca Gino at Harvard Business School along with a couple of Danish researchers. So they looked at 2 million test scores from Danish students, again, where students are randomly assigned to take the test at different times of day. Uh, and it turns out that there's a material difference in scores between students who take the test early and students who take the test late. That taking the test in the afternoon, kids who took the test in the afternoon scored as if they'd missed two weeks of school. <laughs> Which is just um, like, now, that is a lot. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's crazy for a whole host of reasons. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of terrifying in a way. Yeah. Because especially here in the United States, we use standardized tests as a policymaking tool. Right. And that to me says, whoa, uh, that might be a less effective policymaking tool than we think if we have that kind of variance based on something like time of day. I think what's even more alarming is that schools will make decisions about individual students based on their standardized test scores. And so if you have a kid who scores low, her in the afternoon, and you make a decision about the course of her academic program based on that score, when if she had been randomly assigned to take tests in the morning, she would have scored higher. That's alarming. Right. To me. And as you say, there is a mount of evidence showing this, that, that, you know, there's some experimental evidence showing jurors make different decisions in the afternoon versus in the jurors morning. make different sentencing decisions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the healthcare examples are chilling so <laughs> that never meet with have, a doctor in the afternoon, right? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't go, I, I seriously would not go to an important doctor appointment in the afternoon. Uh, if I could avoid it, I would not go to a discretionary hospital. I will not go to a discretionary hospital visit in the afternoon. if I can avoid <laughs> it there, I think the evidence is overwhelming. I don't even think it's a close call. Uh, if you look at things like anesthesia errors, four times more likely at 3 p.m. than at 9 a.m., uh, there was just a paper that came out uh, maybe two months ago about how doctors in afternoon appointments are much more likely to prescribe opioids than they are in morning appointments. Uh, we've seen that. Uh, Jeff Lindner did research showing that doctors are much more likely to prescribe unnecessary antibiotics mm -hmm. in afternoon appointments versus morning appointments. I mean, again, if across the whole needles, realm, knives, or, or drugs, don't do it in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, just even in terms of like, even in terms of like just this general judgment, like people, like many people, not all people, but many people are less mentally acute in the afternoon than they are in the morning. So like I would go to a routine teeth cleaning in the afternoon. Sure. I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. But when it comes to something that's actually pretty significant about my health, or the health of someone I care about, no freaking way. So the good news, though, is that the day has a fairly predictable and regular pattern to it. And you've been able to uh, analyze that and extrapolate some learning about when you are good at certain things and what kinds of tasks you should allot to different parts of the day. So um, what's the rhythm? The rhythm is uh, we see, again, uh, I'll spare you all the evidence of this, but what we see across a number of different methodologies and disciplines is that in general, our mood, our mood and our performance move through three stages, a peak, a trough recovery. For about 80% of us, people who are either have, an, have a morning chronotype, that is, they, they typically wake up early and go to sleep early, or are kind of in the middle, the pattern typically goes in that order, peak early in the day, trough in the middle of the day, recovery later in the day. 
for people who are night owls, people who have an evening chronotype, uh, it's much more complicated, but they hit the key with them is that they hit their peak much later in the mm-hmm. day, you know, uh, early evening, middle of the evening, late in mm-hmm. the evening. Um, and so, and, and what we see is that during the peak period, uh, people perform better on analytic work. That is work that requires heads down, focus and attention. So it'd be something like writing a brief. Your, your deep work time is morning time. Yeah. Yeah. The work that work that benefits from focus, mm-hmm. uh, the key attribute of the peak is that that's when we're most vigilant. We're able to bat away distractions. And so we need to be locked down and focused early in the day is better. The research doesn't tell us that everybody should begin working at 8.15 or 9.15 or 4.30 in the morning. You got to figure that out on your own. There's some very individual variants there. But in general, mornings early in the day is better for analytic work. The trough period, which is early to mid-afternoon, that's a really bad time for people. You see all kinds of decrements in performance in that time period. And so what you're better off doing there where you can is doing your administrative work. Work that doesn't require a lot of mental acuity, work that doesn't require massive amounts of imagination or creativity. Uh, the quintessential example to me is answering your routine email. Uh, right. And then don't answer your email in the morning. Wait until afternoon. Well, I, I, think I think there's a very good ar- <laughs> I think there's a very good argument for that because our peak time, our, our, our period of peak vigilance, where we're best able to do analytic heads down work, is relatively it's real it's somewhat ephemeral i mean it's a, it's it's a few hours during the day and mm-hmm. so if you eat into those few hours of the day answering your bogus you know, answering your e- email that could easily wait a few hours you're you're exacting a cost on yourself now so 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 that so you're better off doing it during the trough period then so the later in the day for 80 percent of us is actually i think it's a really interesting time of day so what we see is that yeah. our mood is back up late in the afternoon early in the evening our mood goes back up but our vigilance does not and that ends up offering a really interesting combination. Uh, if you think about pairing high mood with lower vigilance, it turns out, again, we have a massive amount of evidence of this, that, that people are better able to do what psychologists call insight problems. Then those are problems that solving problems that don't have an obvious answer, that, 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 that don't bend to mathematical logic, that require divergent thinking, that require seeing around corners, that require some form of mental looseness. Uh, mm-hmm. brainstorming in men, some ways is the signature example of this. Like you don't want to be, bra- you don't want to do brainstorming when uh, with a bunch of people who are hypervigilant because they'll say that's, you know, you need to be looser than that. And so, uh, so the design principles are relatively straightforward. We should be doing our analytic work during our peak, our administrative work during the trough and our insight work during the recovery. I like that so much. Um, especially cause it's an excuse to like, to go get cocktails with friends and dream up new business ideas or new trial strategies in the evening. Uh, there's, uh, there, I mean, perfect. seriously, there's, there is, <laughs> I'm serious. There's something to be, there's something to be said for that. On the other hand, if you have an office full of owls, then you actually want those folks writing, you know, those folks are probably better off starting to write their briefs at seven mm-hmm. in the evening or eight in the evening and working till midnight. For sure. Okay, so let's uh, let's come back to the provocative statement now. You won't even you won't go see a doctor in the afternoon. No. Um, it it does seem to me that if you are as sure of the science as as you are, and and I like having having listened to you, having looked up some of this stuff myself, I I have begun to reorganize my day around these principles because I believe you. We've actually moved our team meetings to Monday afternoons because they're just an administrative check in that we were wasting an hour on Good. Tuesday morning doing. Good. So like. I believe that it is worth reorganizing my day around this to the extent I can. It does seem to me that lawyers time in the afternoon is worth less. So should lawyers be billing less after lunch? Well, uh, I'll give you two answers to that. The first is, the first <laughs> if is, one of them is, if depends, you get your gold lawyer star for the day. The first of them is <laughs> now the first, the first one is probably, but the second one is, is an answer. It's not even an answer. It's like, let me see you and raise you on that. Mm. Uh, which is that, uh, I'm not convinced well, actually, I am convinced. I'm convinced that lawyers should not have billable hours in the first place. Right. Um, one enough. of the things you see going back to the work in on motivation is that uh, billable hours are okay. Let, let's let's go back to this notion of autonomy. We know that autonomy and self-direction lead to better performance for complex work. There's no question about that. When we think about autonomy. The opposite of autonomy is control. And human beings have only two reactions to control. They comply or they defy. And so if in, in, in circumstances of control, you're going to get compliant people or, or defiant people. I, I'm, my, I'm the defier. <laughs> my, my, view, my view is that the 
And the view of, of some evidence in social psychology is that the billable hour is one of the most autonomy thwarting, controlling, self-direction inhibiting mechanisms that one has. It puts the focus on the clock rather than on the work. And I think it, it is arguably one reason why many lawyers are so unhappy is that they are being controlled by the clock rather than having the liberty to do their best work when they want it. At the same time, I'm surprised that clients haven't pushed back. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> why and, not? <laughs> and, and at some level, at some level, it's idiotic. Like we would mm -hmm. not, we would not tolerate this in any other profession. So think about, you mentioned uh, programmers, you mentioned like software engineers. So imagine if you had a software engineer who said, um, so I wrote this code and it works really well and it took me two hours versus someone who said, I wrote this code and it works pretty well and it took me 20 hours. Mm -hmm. Who's the better software writer? No idea. Like, who do you want on your team? <laughs> you know, and so, and, and with lawyers, you actually have this perverse incentive where you actually, the person who took longer to do the mm -hmm. same job is actually more valuable to you. Right. When it's not true in any other kind of, in, in any other kind of profession. And so what you have is, so, so it's just, it's, it's absolutely, I think it's perverse. I'm, I'm still astonished that it is so prevalent in law firms. I think it has- Because it's easy. Uh, well, I think there are a few reasons. I think you're totally right. It's easy, all right? Uh, uh, that, that's one reason. Number one, it's like, you know, there's a, there's a status quo bias. So if you've always done some, if I do something mm -hmm. on Tuesday, the odds are very good. I'm going to do it the same way on Wednesday. Uh, and then um, you also have a profession that is populated by people who are, intensely risk averse and a professional code that understandably is about in many cases about risk aversion about prudence and risk aversion and so you have a lot of obstacles to to change even though i do think that the billable hour is one of the reasons so many lawyers are so unhappy oh uh, for sure and that i mean honestly that that is something we've been talking about a fair amount on this podcast because it's a big problem for lawyers and I suppose, though, when you talk about what times of day you should be good at things, it also strikes me that afternoon lawyers should probably go take a nap instead, because like administrative work that doesn't require much brain power is not the kind of work that you ought to be charging, whether it's under a billable structure or otherwise, it's probably not the thing that you went to law school to provide to your clients anyway. <laughs> and so when, if you are reallotting your work so that you're doing all of your valuable stuff that you can charge a lot of money for in the morning, then in the afternoon, you're left with... Um, stuff that you really can't or shouldn't be charging much for. You, you're not doing lawyer yeah. work then. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, again, I, again, I, I think that's right, but I, I think the bigger problem is the billable hour itself. So, for instance, oh, like right. But I mean, even if you're billing flat fees, like if I'm billing flat fees, I'm going to be motivated to find something else to do with that administrative work because all of a sudden it's going to be very clear to me that there's no value in me doing that work. Okay, I, I'm with you. So I'll give you an yeah. example. So I had to engage a lawyer. I'm, I've, I've engaged a lawyer right now for um, to help me uh, deal with an intellectual property issue where someone has violated some of my IP rights. And what, what I need to do is, well, the, the initial stage is, is for him to write, if the lawyer is a male, is, is for him to write a, um, you know, a fairly detailed letter explaining why this is a massive violation and urging the people to repair it. The gold um, threatening cease and desist letter. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, there's some degree of complexity to it. It's not as sort of cut and dry of a cease and desist letter as possible. The remedies are a little bit more complicated. I won't go into the facts of all of it, but, but it requires, you know, it's like not the kind of thing, it's the kind of thing that you need a good lawyer for. Mm -hmm. All right. So my lawyer, unfortunately is charging me by the hour. I would rather have him charge me a flat fee. And if he were to charge me a flat fee, I would want him to decide when the time that he could write the best letter. Because what I want is, as a client, is I want the best letter possible. And if that if it takes him an hour to do it, great. If it takes him five hours to do it, fine. I just want a I just want a, a great letter. What I should be paying for is the quality of the product. I should be paying for the output rather than the input. Again, right. I'm not the first person to say this. This is not rocket science that I'm talking about. But I think, <laughs> I think what amazes me is how persistent this archaic practice of the billable hour is how stubborn it is, how difficult it is to erase. Yeah, for sure. 
No, I'm, uh, I, you're not going to find any objections from me. I'm, we're on the same page there. Dan, where should our listeners go to learn more about your work, to, to read more about the science we've, we've alluded to but haven't laid out there? Part of me wants to just beat people over the head with it so that they know how real it is, but we should probably send them somewhere else. Is the book the best place or, or your website, or where would you like people to go? Well, I mean, if you're interested in looking at some of the science, and then, again, what I'm, what I'm trying to do in, this, in these books, both books we've talked about, in fact, both Drive and When, is say, let's examine these bodies of science and let's try to take what we've learned from the science and apply it to our everyday lives. So the books are a mix of the science and the application. And I think those are the best sources for people who want to learn more about these particular topics. That said, I also have a website uh, where there are all kinds of free resources and videos and things like that if people want to you know, snack rather than, you know, buy the Happy Meal. Very cool. Well, we'll stick the link to your website as well as the links to your, to your ouvre in the show notes so people can click over and find it. Dan, thanks so much for being with us today. And thanks for all your work. It's really helped illuminate a lot of things for a lot of people. So I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast. Are you interested in implementing the ideas you've heard on today's podcast into your law firm? Could you use a little help? Hey guys, it's Stephanie, the VP of Community Success here at Lawyers, and I'd love to help you tackle your business or take it to the next level. Head over to go.lawyers.com backslash start to sign up for a quick call with me, and let's talk about how Lawyerist can help you create your best law firm. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.